Good morning and welcome to the 2020 Big Connect presented by Comcast Business. Our last day after four days will be getting started in just a couple of moments. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Big Connect presented by Comcast Business. It's been three great days, one more great day of networking and speakers to go. We're so excited to have you here with us uh, as we navigate the future of your business now. This is obviously a very different year, uh, but business keeps on moving on and it keeps happening here at the Big Connect. Uh, we have so many people to thank uh, and we wanna get to our investors, um, also want to thank everyone that's helped make this event a great event uh, over the last several days. I mentioned our investors. That's how we've been able to put on programming throughout the entire year, uh, including this programming today. But uh, even as we've gone through the pandemic, the support of our investors has been so critical to what we do at the Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank them all uh, for everything. Uh, as I said, another Great day of networking and speakers. We have the Zoom networking rooms uh, presented by Southern Connecticut Gas and UI. Also our speakers today, uh, Ross Doutha, a uh, columnist for New York Times will join us at nine o'clock. Extremely excited to hear from Ross. Uh, then we'll hear about mindfulness, cultivating clarity in difficult times. Tara Healy with Harvard Pilgrim. We're going to talk about jobs today. And so we're going to have Paul Mayer Unique Staffing Structures, The New Contract Worker in the Gig Economy. That's at 10 a.m. At 11 a.m., Wanda Larry from the Workforce Alliance will join us talking about Train for Tomorrow. And then How to Get Hired, Pamela Shand, uh, a career coach, will offer her advice and tips at noontime. Again, networking available throughout the entire day. Uh, I do want to give a special thanks to all of our sponsors, uh, the Shed Group, Workforce Alliance, Foxwoods Resort Casino, Offer Stage Consulting, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, and Mind the Moment. And again, of course, Comcast Business for helping us put on this programming today. All of our media sponsors, you can see them here on your screen. They've been helping us get the word out about this great event. And finally, we want to uh, thank our Expo Committee that's done an excellent job. Uh, they've been working since the end of the last Expo to try to put this together. And obviously, uh, we had to make a shift uh, about halfway through, and we came up with some new ideas on how to put on an expo, and, and they've just been great in helping us secure speakers. Glenn McDermott as the committee chair, uh, Tamika and the rest of the staff at the chamber uh, who have also put in so much time to this event. So thank you to everyone. Now, every morning, uh, we do start with our, I do, before I get to that, let me say one more announcement. Uh, we do have our regional economic outlook coming up on December 10th. That's another one of our annual events. It will be virtual. Uh, excited to be with People's United Bank again. John Trainer will give us his outlook, uh, including what the vaccine could mean for the economy in 2021. Now, let me get to start with our, and we've been doing that every morning at 8.50, and we're lucky to be joined by Bria Lucky, artist and art therapist, and Bria's vision is to use art to create community connection. So let's start with art with Bria. Bria, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The floor is yours, Bria. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And for the guests in the audience today, my invitation to you is to begin by taking in a deep breath. You may be sitting in your chair, getting ready for your day of wonderful information and connection. And I'd love you to start just with a breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Maybe bring your arms up uh, to the top of your head if that feels good. Just noticing yourself in this moment. And I want to invite you into art making that's accessible and fun and only requires uh, of materials that you have in your office or home as a way of noticing your creativity and recognizing it as a practice that can support you in business, in family life, and throughout all the arenas of your life and day as a way of following your curiosity, cultivating a connection to your intuition and stepping into possibility. 
And I would love to begin now by sharing my screen and bringing you through um, a little adventure. Let's see. So I wanna make sure everyone is with me. Hi. Um, okay, excellent. Here we go. <laughs> I'm having a, a funny little Zoom moment here. Thanks for working with me. I like how you're staying very positive with it though. Thanks. Okay, so let's begin. Thank you so much. So you have your supplies, your pen, Sharpie's a great traditional office pen, scissors, paper, if you're using plain paper or bags. And I prefer to work with a bag because it's a loop that gets created immediately when you cut it. So if you're using a small shopping bag, that's great, or a larger like grocery bag. And I'm gonna use this larger grocery bag and begin. So this is my invitation to you to begin by cutting a width from one side to the other side of the bag. It's maybe like the length of your pinky. And I'm gonna cut below, or a little bit longer. I'm gonna cut below the handle. I'm actually cutting through two bags. I'm not worrying about the cut. Oops, I'm gonna about the cut being perfect, just basically let go of the top, and then I'm just going to flip it over. It's bigger than the length of my pinky. It's like a two or three inch width, I guess, or height. It's going to be a height. Um, the paper. So I have this piece of paper, and I actually have two. Take one out, put it to the side for it later. And then this one, as you can see from like the aerial view, you can open it up, it's just like the top of the bag or a section of the bag. And what I'm going to invite you to do is to turn it inside out. So that's the inside. And you're just like twisting it so if it had any drawings on it or graphics, the brown of the bag is up. And you'll notice that naturally there's a seam here and one on the other side. So I'm going to invite you to work left to right, or actually I'm just going to invite you to start in the middle. So you can have the middle of your paper um, right in front of you. And this is such an intuitive process. And what I'm going to do is draw a face and invite you to do the same by breaking it down into shapes. And because you're drawing from your imagination using shapes, if you follow me, you'll have a face emerge and no face will be the same. So I began by drawing this U, which is the lower half of the face. And the wonderful thing about this is that we all have different facial shapes and expressions at different times. And that's like, the magic of knowing each other and being in this world, all the variety and connection at the same time. So I've done this U, drawn this U. Now I'm gonna draw two like almond shapes, one on each side for the eyes. And what those are comprised of is an up half circle and a down half circle. So I'm just literally drawing like the up and the down if this is an eye with an up and down circle, the width between the right eye and the left eye will be about the same space. And that's an average like anatomical rule, but it's not really that essential that it's like, please don't worry about making it perfect, just continue on. And then another up line and an up line. And then you can draw your nose with like a down line and a nostril or Maybe you can go over with a point of a nose and a nostril, and that's the beginning of the face. And then the mouth could simply be a line 
or it could be a line with like an M, an elongated M, like two mountains and a downline, similar to the downline of the eye. And then the eyeball is another U shape, similar to the whole of the face, the chin and the cheeks. And you can draw it like that. And when you draw the eye, let it touch on the bottom to use. And then to draw in the eye, what I love to do is make kind of a sloppy C almost, and then just fill it in. And the same on this eye. Once again, that's that kind of what I'm calling sloppy is just a way of making it look really organic, which is impossible not to, which is the good news about art. Um, and then what I'm going to do is draw an ear, which is like a long kind of flat C, backward C, and forward C. And I know that those are kind of to the side of the eyes. Then what I'm going to do is play with the hair. So for this person, I'm going to just give them like what I would think of as a bowl cut almost. And I'm going to, and they're going off of the frame, off of this page. And that's it. And then I'm going to go on to draw a series of faces. So you can, what I think is best is to begin. But if you want to watch me continue on, I'll kind of blow through my process and we can take it from there. And when you get to the end and here's your seam, you can just kind of begin a new workspace. Just allow the features to kind of create the personality of your uh, emerging face. I went in and added the detail of a neck and shoulders to some of these characters that I created, these members of a community, maybe my community from my imagination. Um, and that just. Hi there. I'm coming back to you after sharing the beginning of the process that I'd love to invite you to go deeper into enjoying your imagination and what happens between your imagination and your heart and your hand. And my invitation to you is to just take a deep breath, enjoy the process, return to it at lunchtime if that feels good. And I'm going to share a video that brings you through the entire process of binding this little mini portrait book on my website and that's for you and I'll link that in my profile. So thank you for joining me. Let's take one more deep breath <sighs> before you step into the rest of your day. Thank you, Bria. We appreciate it. And um, you can follow Bria. She's going to go over to the Zoom networking lounge. Uh, we'll post that okay. in the chat and she's going to continue. And uh, like we said, we start with art every morning. Art is such an important part of New Haven and our region. Uh, even for our business community. And so we want to make sure that we put a spotlight on it and we appreciate Bria being with us this morning. Uh, we're about to get to our first speaker of the day, Ross Dotha. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to get in a, a message from Paul Savis with Comcast Business, our presenting sponsor for the Big Connect this morning. Hey, good morning. It's Paul Savas with Comcast Business. I know you're looking forward to a great day here at the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce, Big Connect. You know, we're excited to be the presenting sponsor for now our 11th year. It's an amazing opportunity to showcase some of the best that the local businesses in our business community have to offer. 
businesses just like yours. Take the time, go to the virtual booths, enjoy the day, make great connections, and support the Chamber. Have a great day, and thanks for being part of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce, Big Connect. And thank you, Paul. And now it's my pleasure to welcome in our, our keynote speaker for this morning, uh, Ross Doutha. Uh, Ross is an author and a columnist with the New York Times. Uh, he comments on the political, on um, politics and the election. And uh, what I also wanna let you know about Ross is he is a uh, New Haven resident, uh, born and raised here and lives here in New Haven. And uh, through Jeff Klaus, our chair of board, uh, was able to get in touch with Ross and uh, he's, and very generous to offer us a few minutes this morning to talk about the election. I thought I'd just list a few of his comments, uh, his columns right before the election. Um, have we learned nothing after four years of Trump? Is Trumpism after Trump? And 2020 will not be decisive. Uh, I think we're definitely seeing a lot of that. And Ross, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, thanks so much for having me, Garrett. Um, can everybody see me, or is my... Uh, cameras, we're not seeing your camera, but I'll make sure that you have the... It says I'm unable to start video because the host here, let's hold on. There we go, beautiful. There we go. Um, <clears throat> much better. Um, so thank you, Garrett, for that kind introduction. Um, thanks to everyone for, for joining, and it's, it's really a privilege to be here. Um, as Garrett mentioned, I do not in fact, run a business in New Haven, except in the sense that um, I write newspaper columns out of my home here. So maybe in a sense, I, I do run a business here. Um, but I did grow up here, uh, grew up in Brantford and then in the New Haven portion of Foxen, right where New Haven, Staven and North Haven meet. And uh, went to Hampton Hall, went away to college and then lived in Washington DC for a long time and then ended up back here with my family about three years ago, and um, it's been great to be back. I really like New Haven, um, and I obviously appreciate um, <clears throat> everything that all of you do to make it such a fun and entertaining place, and hopefully an even more entertaining place once more people are going to businesses again in the very near future. Um, so I'm gonna talk for about 10 to 12 to 15 minutes about the election and its aftermath, and then I think with Garrett's mediation, I'm going to take questions on, you know, just about anything you guys are interested in. Um, and then I'll send everyone off to the next adventure. Um, but so, you know, <clears throat> I guess I'll pick up from uh, one of the titles of the columns that, that Garrett just referenced, the 2020 election will not be decisive, which was actually a column that I had to write the night of the election itself, uh, which is, you know, one of the exciting things about the newspaper business is that you're occasionally called upon to pretend to have knowledge of events, even as they're happening and changing in front of your eyes. Um, so that column didn't start out being entitled, <laughs> the 2020 election will not be decisive. It started out talking about in its first draft, the possibility of a Joe Biden landslide. And then of course, as the night went on, the various versions of the column that ran, you know, in the 5 a.m. edition of the newspaper and the 7 a.m. edition of the newspaper and so on changed and moved more and more towards the final product, which appeared online, I guess, at 1 a.m. or so, um, saying, guess what, we're back to a stalemate. And I think that's the best way to think about this election. Um, I think the surprise of 2020, the surprise of the presidential election is in a year of you know, um, basically near apocalypse, plague, protest, revolution, mass death, um, wild political drama, the election itself was in certain ways the least interesting or in certain, you could say sort of most predictable and normal result. Um, and it seemed a bit more abnormal than people expected because once again, um, polling was bad, including polls conducted by my own newspaper. Um, which were part of a general pattern where once again, uh, Donald Trump was underestimated by somewhere from three to four to five points, failing to correct or maybe just not correcting enough for the errors of 2016. So that 
polling failure made the result itself seem like a surprise. But if you had gone back in time to, um, you know, 2019 or 2017 and said, well, guess what? The 2020 presidential election is going to look a lot like the presidential election in 2016. And it's going to swing to the Democrats because of very small shifts in a few swing states. And so the Democrats will win by slightly more in the popular vote than Hillary Clinton won. Um, but, and they'll hold the House and Republicans will probably hold the Senate or it will end up 50-50 pending the runoff in Georgia. Everyone would have said, well, that's, you know, that's the most boring, but therefore, you know, most stable possible result. Um, and that's, I think, a useful way to think about where we are, that um, in spite of sort of the wild drama of the Trump era, American politics is very closely divided, very polarized, as everybody knows. Um, and divided government and has been a feature of American politics, uh, you know, for as long as I've been writing about it. And it's likely apparently to remain so. So even if you sort of inject these sweeping historical events into the storyline, um, even if you have, you know, things happen that will make 2020 have its own special page in the history books, you still end up with the same kind of balancing out where a few voters move right and a few voters move left. Um, and the result is 49-49 or 50-47 or 51-48, uh, which is a huge change from most of American political history. Uh, what was normal in most of American political history, especially in the 20th century, was much bigger swings from election to election, and presidents generally won, won big when they won. Um, there were obviously close elections, 1960, Kennedy and Nixon, 1976 with Carter and Ford, but the norm for a successful presidential campaign would be to win by five, six, seven, eight, even, you know, nine or ten points. And that kind of world seems to have gone away. Um, it seemed for a little while in the polls like Joe Biden might have the chance to bring it back, but that's obviously not what happened. And I think you can see this kind of weird canceling out effect in um, a lot of the, uh, a, a, the way a lot of the events that happened in the last year sort of affected the presidential race, right? So you had um, you know, a temporary stock market crash and a botched response to a global pandemic, both of which seem to a lot of people like they should, you know, automatically cost Donald Trump the election. But then to some extent, canceling that out, you had a pretty robust federal government response to the economic crisis, a very robust response from the Federal Reserve that kept the economy afloat and actually gave a lot of Americans more disposable income over the course of the summer, weirdly, than they had before the pandemic even started. So in a strange way, you had these polls where people would be asked, you know, are you better off economically than you were four years ago? And you would have majorities saying yes, in spite of all the economic trauma um, that the country that the country had gone through. So you had that kind of canceling out. Um, then you had other forms of canceling out. I think that the, uh, you know, the way sort of specific things that Trump did and said, um, not surprisingly, you know, were things that people didn't like. <laughs> Trump was never, never a popular figure, never a sweepingly popular figure throughout his presidency. Um, but at the same time, I think, uh, you know, events, events over the summer, um, especially, you know, some of the violence around the edges of, of the George Floyd protests, um, some of the turbulence in American institutions around that time, statues coming down, institutions like my own, the New York Times being in internal turmoil, I think created a certain kind of anxiety um, about where the political left was going and what it would mean to give the Democratic Party and the political left full power. And so you had, you know, you had a May, maybe to some people, a surprising number of voters who voted against Donald Trump at the top of the ticket, but still voted for Republican senators or Republican congressmen. There seemed to be an anxiety about um, sort of handing full power to either political party, um, but but certainly handing full power to the Democratic Party in some popularity. 
And then you also you also have a kind of demographic canceling out where um, Trump, to no one's surprise, as in 2018, performed very poorly by Republican standards in a lot of um, affluent upper middle class suburbs that used to be traditional Republican territory. Um, uh, in, in the Northeast, in fact, Trump did a lot worse uh, than he did last time, mostly because of white suburbanites who were sort of lifelong Republicans who were just, you know, just couldn't vote for him. Um, but then at the same time, he did better than uh, some people expected uh, with, with minorities, with Hispanics and African Americans and Asian Americans. Uh, and so did Republicans overall. So you see Republicans picking up House seats in places in California that have large Asian American populations. You see Trump picking up support in South Florida and along the Rio Grande um, among, among Hispanics. Um, and again, those two migrations canceled each other out. And you know, you ended up with one of the one of the stranger features of this presidency, which has been so defined by race and debates about whether the president is a racist, um, and by you know, I think frankly, his own deliberate attempt sometimes to inflame racial division. In an odd way, in the actual vote, America had became slightly less racially polarized in this election cycle than it was certainly when Barack Obama was the Democratic candidate for president. Um, the Democratic coalition became a little whiter, the Republican coalition became a little more diverse, and once again, you ended up with this stalemate. Um, <clears throat> so just briefly, I'll say something about what that means for policy, which, uh, you know, I don't think will be um, that much of a surprise to, to any of you, but we're in this, we're in this situation where um, the combination of that broad stalemate with the particular fact that the president seems to have no interest in conceding the election and starting an orderly transition, let alone um, pushing for legislation in the lame duck session, means that we're essentially postponing all policy responses to our current coronavirus shadowed situation until the beginning of the Biden presidency. I, you know, there's still some very small possibility that Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell could come up with a very small you know, further relief package, but it's very unlikely. The most likely scenario is that coronavirus relief gets folded into larger budget negotiations. Um, you get a bunch of sort of big executive action moves from Joe Biden early on. Um, but in many ways, until that point, we're, we're all sort of on our own. And we're, the good news is that, you know, there's real light at the end of the tunnel. It's very likely, you know, we've had a huge success with vaccine development. Um, it seems very likely that vaccinations will start even within this year. Um, and by springtime, you know, if I were betting on the state of the United States in um, the first, you know, at month four of the Biden presidency, I would imagine that things would be looking very good, that you would have large-scale vaccination, that combined with a little herd immunity and with warmer weather would really be knocking the virus down. Um, you, so you would have this sense of a return to normalcy um, joined to at least some money, not the kind of money that was expected if Democrats controlled the entire government, but some money sluicing into the economy. Um, so I would be very bullish on you know, the prospects for American business next June or July. The problem is the next three months and what happens in those next three months, um, both in the economy and obviously in public health, where we're on a really, really terrible trajectory with, with COVID that's going to lead, I would expect, to more and more cities doing temporary lockdowns again. You won't get any kind of federal policy, but you'll get you know, cities and states um, doing more to try and, to try and contain the virus. Um, so it's just a very odd position to be in. Um, but in that position, you have basically a federal government that is um, abdicating its responsibilities to do much of anything in response, um, which, you know, probably would not be happening if Trump had won re-election. He would have all kinds of incentives to um, sort of be, be pushing legislation at the moment. But um, in the event, he prefers, he's preferring to push uh, legal challenges that are likely to fail. We're likely to get the Biden presidency. And we're likely to have a better spring, um, but a very 
I'll stop there. It's 915. Um, and um, I'm happy to talk about anything that you guys would like to talk about for for the next 15 minutes with my limited limited expertise <laughs> for the conversation. Uh, appreciate it, uh, Ross. Uh, one question I've seen already uh, in the chat. What, what do you expect uh, with the Biden presidency um, and Congress, if Congress, uh, you know, let's say Republicans do end up uh, retaining control of the Senate, um, do you expect it to be roadblocks or that there will be some sense of, of working together? I mean, I think in part, it will depend on what, you know, some of the choices that the Biden administration itself makes sort of what, uh, you know, how much it wants to have a big push to try and sort of find bipartisan common ground and to what extent it might see itself as benefiting from a perception that, you know, Mitch McConnell is just blocking everything. Um, so I think sort of the choices, you know, how heavily Biden leans into executive action in the first few months versus how much time he spends schmoozing Mitt Romney and Susan Collins and others will go a long way towards determining, you know, how far bipartisanship can get. And so I can, you know, I can see sort of realities moving in either direction in that sense. Um, I would, I would assume though that in, you know, in a Senate that is, that is as close as the Senate's going to be, no matter what happens in the Georgia runoff. And by the way, I should say, I think Republicans are mildly favored in that runoff, but by no means definitively favored. And there's enough chaos within the Georgia Republican Party right now, thanks to um, sort of Trump's demands for, uh, you know, voter fraud investigations and his feuds with local Republican officials and so on that, you know, you can imagine a scenario where Democrats get better turnout and win those seats, in which case we really are 50-50 with, with Vice President Harris breaking the tie. But either way, um, uh, there's a lot of potential power flowing to a small group of, um, of, of sort of moderate or swing state senators. Susan Collins is about to be the most powerful woman in America, except maybe for Amy Coney Barrett. <laughs> so it's the, it's the Collins-Barrett um, future. But uh, but Collins, Joe Manchin, Mitt Romney, like th those are the people and a few others that John Tester that we should be focusing on. And I think what, what you should look for apart from sort of, there'll be an immediate question about, about, you know, what kind of coronavirus relief goes into budget negotiations. But then you should also look at areas that are of particular interest to those, to those politicians, right? So, um, Romney and a few other Republicans, for instance, have expressed openness to um, new tax credits or tax cuts for families, right? Some kind of some kind of family tax benefit or something. That's something that there are Democrats who support. Um, so you could imagine some kind of you know negotiation in that space. Um, I, I would not imagine you know anything happening big on healthcare. Um, because that's an issue that Republicans generally aren't good at and see as a democratic issue and aren't likely to cut big deals on. But I think sort of, you know, could you imagine some, you know, some sort of small, small climate legislation, for instance, that, um, you know, that, that was, did, was sort of nuclear energy friendly and doing some investment in carbon capture and things that some Republicans support and also took a few things out of the Green New Deal that weren't tax increases. Um, yeah, you could, you could potentially imagine something like that. Um, and you could also imagine, you know, the sort of biggest picture thing you could imagine is some kind of blowout where Biden says, you know what, I'm going to give Republicans, the five big tax cuts they always wanted in return for more spending on all, you know, on, on, on these six priorities. Um, sort of the opposite of the kind of deals that uh, Obama tried to cut with Republicans, the sort of trade, trade tax increases for entitlement cuts, right? You know, to the extent that there's a grand bargain available in the in the year of our Lord 2021, it's going to blow the deficit <laughs> to large the largest level it's it's ever been, which may which may not happen. I think Republicans will have incentives to suddenly, you know, rediscover deficit and 
they might not go along with that kind of deal. But were there such a deal, it would be, you know, we, we're going to have the lowest capital gains tax rate in history, plus, you know, spending on these six liberal priorities. Uh, <clears throat> President Trump's been a unifying force for the Biden coalition. Does that change on January 21st if he's no longer in Washington? To some extent, yeah. I, I mean, some of it depends on some of those sort of budgetary things that I'm talking about. I mean, I think the big, the big, the biggest potential peril for the Democratic coalition is that um, they are now increasingly the party of a lot of very affluent voters in states like Connecticut um, and a lot of um, service sector workers, um, uh, poor working class, poor and working class voters. And the way that tension could be most manifest is if, you know, the Biden administration decided to raise taxes and it's promised to only raise taxes on the very wealthy, but you could, you know, it's very easy to imagine, or it's, it's possible to imagine an attempted Biden tax increase on people making $250,000 a year um, in order to pay for some new program that's popular with a lot of Democrats that ends up angering a lot of the suburbanites who voted for Biden, right? But I think that's unlikely at the current moment. I think the most, because Republicans have enough power that the Democrats won't be able to pass a tax increase period. So in a way that sort of, that problem is taken off the table for now for, for the Democrats. Um, and so, you know, in fiscal irresponsibility, you can cover over a lot of divisions in your coalition. Um, I think the other challenge for Democrats is a sort of uh, culture war challenge where, you know, the party's activists and its more affluent voters are very socially and culturally liberal. It's uh, working class voters are not, um, especially minority voters in many cases. Um, and that's why you, you've, it's not the only reason, but it's one reason why you've seen, um, you know, minority voters swing towards Republicans more than people who are focused on Donald Trump as white supremacist expected. Uh, so even in New England, right, even as Trump, even as Trump was losing ground overall in New England, the places where uh, Republicans did a little better were um, like in Lowell, Massachusetts, or even, uh, you know, the, the Connecticut specific one is you, you had this, this Waterbury Darien crossover, where Darien used to be the most Republican city in America, or most Republican town in America, and Waterbury was obviously a Democratic stronghold. And Democrats won both Darien and Waterbury this time. Um, but they won Darien, I believe, by more than they won Waterbury. Um, and that partially reflects um, immigrant voters voting for Republicans in Waterbury and Danbury and, and places like that. So that dynamic means that if you get to a legislative stalemate and the Biden administration starts to govern through executive order, there'll be a lot of pressure to, you know, pick some culture war fights because that's what part of his, part of his supporters want like you know like what happened late in the obama era when you had executive orders on transgender bathrooms and you know in schools in red states and so on these these kind of things right um new fights over um you know abortion coverage new fights over what the catholic church and religious hospitals have to do and so on if you get into those kind of fights you you get again a different kind of fracture in the democratic coalition where you could imagine the part of the Democratic Party that's still pretty religious and not socially conservative, but not socially liberal, um, getting getting a bit more alienated too. So those would be a couple intra-democratic splits to look out for. Two last uh, questions. With Trump, what, what do you think happens with him next? When he leaves the White <laughs> House, where does he go? Uh, people speculate he's starting his own news network. Um, is he still going to stay involved from afar? Yes. I mean, I think he's going to, I think right now, if you asked him, um, I mean, I'm sure he changes his mind every, every few minutes, but I think he imagines he's going to run again in 2024. Um, I would be a little skeptical of the idea of some big new Trump media property, um, because that requires a sort of scale of investment and intense effort that doesn't really fit with the Trump organization. 
organization has existed to sort of put its brand on other people's properties for a long time. Um, and that's very different from trying to get a major news network off, off the ground. Um, so I'd be, I think it's more likely that you would see like, um, you know, Trump TV as a kind of internet product that, you know, sell, you know, has subscribers, but it's a little more of a niche phenomenon. And then Trump is, um, um, out, you know, good, does rallies still and, you know, is on Twitter and is available for interviews, you know, rages against Fox news on Twitter, but then shows up on Fox and friends. Like that, that's, that's more what I would expect than some sort of really focused new property though. I, you know, any, anything's possible. Um, and then, you know, we'll have to see how, how much his dominance of the right-wing conversation persists when he's no longer president. And I, you know, you could see it going a lot of ways. I can totally see a future where he is the hundred pound gorilla who nobody wants to run against. And he, you know, he said runs in 2024 saying, I really won. It was stolen from me. You got to nominate me again. And that's a powerful message. I could also see a world where once he has, once he's seen as someone who lost an election and he's getting older um, and debate shift that he fades a bit, but you know, you, you don't, you don't want to assume anything with the Trump phenomenon at this point. Uh, and we wanted to close out, obviously your, your New Haven roots uh, here in this region. Um, what do you think is the opportunity uh, for small cities like New Haven? Are there advantages in the post-pandemic shuffling? I mean, I would I would assume so, right? Um, I I'm a fan of small cities generally. I'm a fan of sort of what uh, what they offer, the mix of sort of the advantages of density without the incredible disadvantages of living in a really congested urban center. The fact that, you know, New Haven gives you the benefits of walkable urbanism and good restaurants and a major university, but you can also get anywhere in the city in about 13 minutes is a really wonderful thing. And I would sort of assume that, you know, a mixture of residual anxiety about the virus itself um, and sort of you know, I, I don't think the telecommuting shift will be generally permanent because I think there are just benefits to in-person work that are real. And so companies will want to pull some of that back, but there will clearly be more telecommuting after all this. And, you know, right now, probably the places from what I can tell from real estate markets, the places benefiting the most from that trend are, are, are the suburbs, again, places that had been sort of, you know, a bit in decline and are now making a comeback. Um, but I think, you know, there's, I think there's a very reasonable argument that for people who right now live in places like Boston and New York and Washington, DC, and are thinking about, you know, a life outside those places that, you know, cities, I mean, New Haven has the particular advantage of Yale, right, which, um, you know, is a huge help that other cities in New England, other small cities don't have to the same extent. Um, but just the small city model as a lure for people who like certain things about the big city, but find it too expensive to raise families, um, you know, too nerve wracking because of what we've just been through. Uh, I, I think there's a pretty clear sales pitch. Um, you know, I mean, just, I mean, I, we, you know, we live, we live in East Rock and it was really striking, you know, in a bunch of the rentals around us, you had people who fled Brooklyn for East Rock, right? For six months, right? During, during, during the pandemic, which I didn't expect exactly, but it sort of, it sort of made sense, right? That like, you know, as, as, as a way of life, living in a walkable neighborhood where you can get to a beach or a state park in 15 or 20 minutes, um, it really seems like a happy medium between the megalopolis and the deep suburbs. Um, so I would be, you know, some of this is just my particular biases. I did, I did grow up here, but I would be reasonably bullish on places like New Haven, especially given Yale, but, but smaller, the sort of small city model more generally for a more distributed post pandemic age. Well, Ross, thank you so much uh, for giving us the time. Uh, we always like to see someone from this region who's doing great things in the world. So uh, <laughs> we appreciate it. I don't know about great things.
<laughs> well, your your column is on Tuesdays and Sundays. Okay. Tuesdays and Sundays in the New York Times. And and thank you again. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, and have a great rest of the conference. Great. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.